Until recently, you didn't even know that these people existed, right? You couldn't count them. There's no social security system in the way that there is here in the U.S. And just about five years ago, India changed that pretty dramatically. One of the um, big internet inter entrepreneurs, Nanda Nilakani, went to the Indian government and said, I will take my 100 best engineers and I'm going to create a first-rate biometric ID system for India. This is better than anything you've seen in the US. So now any Indian who wants to voluntarily goes and signs up, gets 10 fingerprints done, two iris scans done, and then they have a biometric ID that's linked to a number, like your social security number, called Adhar. And now, for the first time, these people can be found. And Modi doubled down on this, the new prime minister, and said, now that we can find all these people, we're going to create bank accounts for them. So in five years, over a billion Indians have signed up for this. Pretty amazing. And Modi has opened over 220 million bank accounts. So where you used to go in the slums and you'd hand out you know, a little free grain and a little free kerosene, and half of it would disappear through graft, now people can take their smartphones or go to the corner store, put in their fingerprints and say, oh, we're owed 500 rupees in pensions, and the rupees go straight into their bank account. So they're starting to solve the problem in a pretty interesting, uniquely Indian way, but they've got a long, long way to go. Okay, um, continue. Side is, um, it's a democracy, power is much more dispersed, and these types of things happen really bottom up. So 10 years ago when I was in the government, I told the story. No one would take you seriously when you said something about corruption. People would just pretend it wasn't happening. Five or six years ago, a gentleman named Anna Hazari, who is sort of older and bespectacled, looks a little bit like Gandhi, had finally had enough. And he went on a hunger strike and he started a minor revolution. So thousands and then tens of thousands of Indians followed him and people went out in the street and said, enough is enough. We don't want to do this anymore. We're done with this. And he didn't get all of the reforms through that he wanted. He wanted an independent entity, like an independent ombudsman to try corruption cases quickly. He didn't quite get that, but he got some of the reforms and he got people to wake up. And it was part of the reason that the previous government, the Manmohan Singh government, was voted out of office and the Modi government was voted in, promising clean governance. Now, the Modi government has been by all accounts, a little bit better. So there used to be a very cozy relationship between big business in India and the government. From what I hear out of Delhi, that has disappeared a little bit. They have to get in line just like everybody else. A lot of licenses have been put online. The biometric ID program that I talked about has made a huge difference in rooting out graft kind of at the bottom level, like the low level official that was stealing half of people's pensions or half of the free grade that they were getting. So in India, all bottom up, in China, all top down. The problem is neither of these are really perfect. So if you, before I started the firm that I now have, I was a lawyer and did a lot of anti-corruption uh, work around the world. The few countries that have actually done this right, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, a few others have done a number of things. They arrest the bad guys at the top, sort of like what China is doing, but they try them in independent courts and very quickly. So no one really thinks that the Chinese crackdown is that independent. It's a little bit politically motivated. They also um, do a lot of education, starting with K through 12 education about what it means to be ethical in society. That isn't happening either in India or in China. And in some cases, they also raise the salaries of lower level government workers to make it less desirable to take bribes. And that isn't happening either. So both of these countries still have a, they're starting, they're starting in different ways, but they both still have a long, long way to go. Lower caste village women um, and battering of women, domestic violence is a particular problem in India. It's really pretty egregious. And there was a group of women who finally had enough. And so now they call themselves the Gulabi Gang. There are now thousands of them all over India. And whenever there is an allegation that someone is beating their wife, they dress up in hot pink saris and they take sticks and clubs and they go beat the guy up. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great.
great. And they'll also do things like mediate dowry disputes because the police refuses to get involved. So it's, it's just a very Indian story. But overall, the police is overtaxed and doesn't really get involved as much as they should. Also, when you look at women in the workforce, in India, I think it's something only like 25 to 28 percent of women work outside the home. In the U.S., it's more like 58 percent. In China, it's 70 percent. So China, the Communist Party was actually very good for women's rights, including there were women who fought their way out of the out of the bush. <laughs> that <laughs> that we really do need to pay more attention to India. And it sounds silly, but the Indians are a very proud people, and they feel it, and they know that Modi comes to the United States, and it is front page news in every Indian newspaper this week, and it hardly made a blip on the screen here. And I would also say that we need, when I'm talking about cooperating on a government-to-government -government front, you need a few really one, maybe one big project that you do together. Because what happens now and what happened in, in a lot of folks in the Obama administration are my friends, so it's not faulting them. But what happened with the India relationship is they weren't acting up, right? They weren't causing any problems on the world stage. So they get lower level of priority. The countries that scream the loudest tend to get the most attention when you're in the State Department or elsewhere. And instead of having, so what we have with India now is we have 15 little initiatives, and none of them are moving forward very quickly. What we need are one or two things where we really can make a difference for people. And they can be environmental, they can be a free trade agreement, wouldn't that be great? No one imagines that with India. It could be a whole, you could choose what they are. It doesn't matter so much what they are. It needs to be a joint project. And I would say the same with China. We need to look very, very hard for a positive thing to do together because right now we are dying death of a thousand little negative cuts. That's fantastic. So please join me in thanking Anya Manuel. And my view is the Indian economy, it's growing right now at between 7 and 8 percent. I think they'll be lucky if they get that the next few years. So we're still kind of 6, 7, 8 percent. Again, that's stuff that we here can only dream of. But, yeah. Okay. Um, set of questions around protectionism. And it feels like we have on the rise a bipartisan. And I think it is not so much a lack of will is a lack of capacity by the Indian authorities to do anything about it. So I talked about the poor and the low caste not being counted. It's hard to know who's being trafficked if you don't know where people are supposed to be, right? Um, it's hard to know who's being trafficked or stop the trafficking if there are too few policemen and if they're paid a pittance. So that's what creates a lot of the problems in India. And there are you know, there are human rights violations in India. It's not, it's not the same level as China, and it's not the same level as a lot of other countries you'd see. But India struggles with it sometimes. And I think the dark side, as much as Modi and his BJP, which is the Hindu Nationalist Party, has been really good for India in an economic sense, the reforms are really starting to take hold, he comes with a dark side. So Modi, was, when he was young, a member of what's called the RSS, which is sort of a, some people call it more like the Boy Scouts, the Indian opposition would call it more like the Hitler Jugend. <laughs> of, um, it's sort of a Boy Scout slash paramilitary type organization where people get together, they're Hindu nationalists, they march, they all wear the same outfits, and that's the positive side, and the downside is that you know, sometimes they're not very nice to Muslims and other minorities. And since Modi has come to power, there have been more attacks on Muslims, not very many, but a man was stoned to death for eating beef. That hadn't happened in a while. So you have these sectarian conflicts in India that arise. They're, frankly, really minor for a country of 1.25 billion people and something like 80 different languages and dialects and many, many religions. But they are there. Lucky enough to be at both. And the Chinese dinner was so formal.
was an hour and a half in a security line, and they had seated, other than the head table, the Chinese and the Americans were mostly seated separately. There wasn't a lot of interaction. And Xi's speech was very formal. It was about, we're going to have to try to get along, and we're working hard to make this work. But underneath, there's a lot of discomfort. Then fast forward to India a couple days later. Modi's an hour and a half late. No one knows who's Indian, who's American, who's Indian American. There are five CEOs, American CEOs on stage. Three of them were actually born in India, right? Microsoft, Google, Adobe, a bunch of others of our iconic countries, companies are run by Indian Americans. So there's just this underlying comfort with India that you don't have with China. But there is a lot we all can do, and I talk about a lot of it in the book. A lot of it is what our companies can do and are already doing. So, for example, our companies aren't perfect, but Chinese factory workers want to work for factories that supply to Americans because the standards are higher, the safety standards are better, the environmental standards are better, and the wages are better. So you would much rather work at Foxconn, never mind all the bad press that Foxconn got about the suicides, than you would for a Chinese-run garment factory. So in that sense, all of you, through shareholder activism with Nike and with Apple, are already having a direct impact in people's lives in China and in India as well. Investment, no matter what Trump says, investment back and forth and trade back and forth is really important, and it helps all of us, and maybe we'll do a separate, I'll talk about that a little bit separately. And then the people-to-people -people exchanges, people poo-poo them because this is not, you know, it's not an immediate impact. It's not like signing a big, big treaty. But it's so important. The more I have Chinese students in my class at Stanford that are really learning about the American way of life, the more I send my students over to Beida to do a semester there. My seven-year-old is learning Mandarin, as many children here in San Francisco are, all of those little micro actions that we all take are actually very important and prevent us creating a US-USSR type dynamic, which nobody wants. That's, of course, a big problem for us. At the same time, Prime Minister Modi and his whole team are actually, I believe, legitimately committed to renewables. A bunch of Indian ministers were here at Stanford last week. We had a long conversation about this. And their plan is to build 100 gigawatts of solar within the next 15 years. That's a lot. Even if they don't, that's like 100 coal plants, 100 giant coal plants worth of solar power. So that's good. Um, if they'll all the way, if they'll get all the way there, you're not sure. The U.S. can help, and we're already helping. Um, um, my husband works with a lot of clean technology companies. They're all trying to do business in China and in India. There are a lot of U.S. government announcements on clean tech initiatives with India, and I would say respectfully, it's peanuts. You know, just now when Obama and Modi were together, they announced something like. 60 million for this clean tech project and 40 million for this joint clean tech project. And that's fine, but that's not where the big shift is going to come. The big shift is going to be in helping India think through the big issues, allowing them to have nuclear power as a base load, helping them think through how to do finance. Some of this stuff gets really boring and esoteric, but it's important. Helping them think through how do you do financing for massive scale solar, because right now that's very expensive. So those are the kinds of areas where we can help and actually